Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have two Sundays left in our series following the life of John Wesley and learning about the beginnings of Methodism. As we hear how revival spread throughout England, America, and beyond, we are looking for lessons that we can learn and reclaim for ourselves, for ourselves, and for the church. If you've been reading along in Adam Hamilton's book, Revival, Faith as Wesley Lived It, you'll see that I'm dividing the content of that final chapter into two messages. <laughs> there is a lot of good stuff in that chapter, and I don't want us to miss any of it. Today, we're talking about Wesley's perseverance in the face of sometimes great opposition. And we're also going to spend a few minutes talking about Charles Wesley and the music of revival. Now, this worship series is titled Revival but that probably was not a word that Wesley used. Wesley more often talked about awakening or reawakening. As Wesley looked at the churches of his day and at fellow Christians, he did not see people living up to the expectations that Jesus had for his followers. In his day and in ours, too many Christians believe that being Christian means to believe in God and to try to be a good person. Wesley knew that being a Christian was so much more than that, especially after his Aldersgate experience, and he was passionate about sharing that message however and whenever he could. So Wesley talked about most Christians of his day being what he called half-Christians or almost Christians. They were spiritually asleep. And he drew on Paul's words from Ephesians 5.14. Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And again, Paul in Romans 13, verse 11. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. Now, Wesley preached this message, and he was preaching his own testimony. You remember, for 35 years, he said, I was a Christian in name only, an almost Christian. And his awakening came at Aldersgate, his experience of Christ's radical, life-changing love and grace. So Wesley was passionate in sharing this message, and it was not always received well. Wesley challenged others to a deeper level of faith and a more serious commitment to personal and social holiness. His words were convicting and sometimes even condemning. Many of his hearers, especially fellow priests and church leaders, were irritated and offended by his enthusiastic messages. J. Ellsworth Callis wrote, the religious swear word in 18th century England was enthusiasm. Religion was generally cool and circumspect in those days, and a show of enthusiasm was in bad taste. Starting off, Wesley was invited to preach at different churches on Sundays, as his fellow Oxford professors were. 
But once he began to preach such challenging messages, one by one, all the churches closed their doors to him. But they could not stop him from preaching. Finding the church pulpits closed, Wesley took the message outside, preaching in fields and marketplaces. At that time in England, every town had a curb market, and in the middle of it stood a cross as a visible reminder to the merchants that Jesus was watching them as they conducted business. As you see, there are steps at the bottom of the cross. Whenever Wesley went to a town to preach, he would go to the cross in the market square he would stand on the steps and begin to sing hymns. People gathered to hear him sing, and then he would begin to preach. Wesley drew crowds of people in the towns and fields where he preached, and the local priests and church leaders of nearby churches felt threatened. They accused Wesley of preaching without authorization, and they even hired local thugs to sabotage his preaching. Here's an example as recorded in his diary from August 28, 1748. At one, I went to the cross in Bolton. There was a vast number of people, but many of them utterly wild. As soon as I began speaking, they began thrusting to and fro, endeavoring to throw me down from the steps on which I stood. They did so once or twice, but I went up again and continued my discourse. They then began to throw stones. At the same time, some got upon the cross behind me to push me down. Did they succeed in stopping Wesley from preaching that day? No. Every time he was knocked down, he got up and resumed his preaching. Growing up, John Wesley had learned about perseverance from his father, the Reverend Samuel Wesley. You remember from the first Sunday in this worship series, the senior Wesley was never truly welcomed by the church that he served for almost 40 years. Throughout his ministry, he was subjected to all kinds of opposition, including being thrown in debtor's prison and having his parsonage set on fire at the hands of his own church members. But he never gave up and he continued to preach. Like his father, John endured all kinds of harassment and attack in the beginning years of the Methodist movement. He was pelted with rotten tomatoes, manure, and stones. He was dragged and beaten with fists. Even homes where he stayed were set on fire. This was his weekly, if not daily, experience for the first 19 years of his outdoor preaching. 19 years. John Wesley persevered through the opposition and never wavered in his evangelical efforts. As Wesley unwaveringly continued his preaching throughout England, his church revival movement grew and eventually the opposition against Wesley decreased. When he reached his 60s, he had become a popular preacher, and by his 70s and 80s, he became a nationally known figure for his preaching and for his role in the church revival movement. With his brother Charles, John Wesley became one of the few graduates of Christ Church College at Oxford University whose names are engraved on the floor of one of the school's buildings, and his portrait is hung in the Great Hall. The Methodist movement, the Great Church Revival, was possible because Wesley never gave up. He persevered. Throughout the many years of opposition, he often turned to the words of Jesus, known as the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes found in the Gospel of Matthew, a portion of which I just read. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. I want to spend another minute or two talking about Charles Wesley and the music 
of revival. Some have argued that in many ways, Charles Wesley served as an important catalyst for John's ministry and actually led the way for his older brother. Charles had his own conversion or heartwarming experience three days before John did. They both embraced field preaching, shared in the itinerant ministry, and organized new and awakened Christians into groups and societies to further their spiritual growth. Charles's unique contribution was in recognizing the power of music for the Spirit's work in revival. I have a great book. It's by J. Ellsworth Callis. It's called Our First Song, Evangelism in the Hymns of Charles Wesley. It was gifted to me by my friend and retired pastor, Kathy Wheeler Boyle. So shout out to Kathy. And if you will bear with me, I just want to read a few of the opening paragraphs. Um, he writes, we Methodists are a singing people. It is not because we have made up our minds to sing or because we feel obligated to do so, but because we have something to sing about, and therefore it would be difficult to restrain our song. Yet even as I say that, I confess that I am referring to the ideal and that perhaps our practice currently falls below our ideal. I'm afraid we don't sing as well as we used to, and if that be so, we ought to know why. I feel it as I go about United Methodism. We sing the same grand words which the redeemed candle makers, street thieves, butchers, and harlots sang 200 years ago. He shares lyrics. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free and to serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. But I have the painful feeling that modern singers mouth what the early Methodists sold. And you can't fool a song. I offer you a measuring stick for judging the state of the church. The better a church is, the better it sings. Conversely, as a church begins to decline, it calls on others to do its singing. The early Franciscans sang they could not do otherwise. Martin Luther produced a body of strong, sure hymnody for a people who believed, even though all hell and a covey of emperors opposed. The Salvation Army sang, and because theirs was a special ministry near the gates of perdition, and because they often had to be heard above street sounds and catcalls, they added brass and percussion to their singing. And we Methodists sang, Lord, how we sang. At the outset, we probably sang better than any religious movement ever had done before, and all things considered, better than any has ever done since. The vigor of our singing was partly because our spiritual ancestors had the good sense to find tunes the untrained could learn and enjoy. But more than that, we had our own songwriter. We had an in-house musician who was part poet, part theologian, part mystic, and very much redeemed. King David was blessed to have Asaph as his chief of singers, and Asaph rewarded Israel with a dozen psalms. John Wesley and the Methodist movement were more generously blessed. Brother Charles gave them hymns by the thousands. It's a great little book, and I look forward to reading more about Charles Wesley. I've heard estimates of the number of hymns and poems written by Charles Wesley. The estimate ranges from 4,400 to 7,000. Anywhere in that range is amazing. The hymns were Charles's poetry set to music, and the tunes were easy to sing. Words and music combined in hymns that taught and reinforced the key theological and spiritual convictions of the movement. Charles's best known hymns are some of our heart songs. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, 
love divine, all loves excelling. Christ the Lord is risen today, and hark, the herald angels sing. The hymns in our worship today are more of his greats. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, and are we yet alive? Now, I can't talk about us singing Methodists today and not name how difficult these days are when we are not gathered in our sanctuary and not singing hymns together. Like the writer of Psalm 137, we lament. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? We are indeed in foreign territory, but know this, we will sing together again. We will return to the sanctuary and we will sing like never before. Do not lose heart. Let's pray. Oh God, we hang on in these days. We long to be gathered together again as a people called Methodist, gathered in our sanctuary and sing at the top of our voices. And in that longing, in that longing, we feel and we sense and we remember and we know, we know revival is there, kindled, waiting to be fanned. I know it. I feel it. So God, fan those flames in us. Bring us together again. Gather us for singing. But God, in the in-between time, I pray that we continue to sing, to hum, to search the internet for those best loved of our hymns, our heart songs, and sing. And God, I am so very grateful as, as we have been hearing and learning of these brothers, John and Charles and their work, their perseverance at the beginning, and you are calling us to, to persevere in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of being separated and feeling isolated and alone. Oh my goodness. God, Fill the spaces between us. Renew us. Awaken us. Even in the midst of these days. When it would be easy to lament and to um, just want to give up. How long, O oh Lord? And your word is, do not lose heart. Help us, Lord. God, when we can't gather for singing together, there are times like even now when we can't gather to even pray together. But we persevere, and we pray anyway, and we join our voices together, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.